Good afternoon to everyone from the U.S. Department of State's Africa Regional Media Hub. I would like to welcome our participants dialing in from across the continent and thank all of you for joining this discussion. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. John Nkingasong, U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy at the U.S. State Department. Dr. Nkingasong will discuss the 20th anniversary of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, as well as the country operational planning, operations planning meeting he is currently holding in South Africa. At that meeting, U.S. government and partner country teams, as well as those who work with PEPFAR, uh, will plan how to carry out the program moving forward and its long-term sustainability. He is speaking with us here in our studios in Johannesburg, South Africa. We will begin today's call with opening remarks from Dr. Nkingasong, and then we will return to your questions. We will try to get to as many of them as we can during the briefing. At any time, if you would like to ask a question live, please indicate that by clicking on the raise hand button and then typing your name, media outlet, and location into the questions and answers tab. Uh, alternatively, you can type your full question directly into the Q&A for me to read to our speaker. Um, most importantly though, please do include your name, your full name, also the name of your media outlet and the location where you're uh, joining us from uh, when you submit a question. If you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, AF Hub Press and follow us on Twitter at Africa Media Hub. Uh, as a reminder, today's call is on the record and with it, with that, I will turn it over to the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy, Dr. John Nkingasong. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your studio. Let me start with, uh, I always enjoy starting, which is the happy 20th anniversary of PEPFA. And my, during my stay here and over the last week, there was a big celebration in Washington, D.C., where President Bush uh, was in Washington and with a whole host of PEPFAR stakeholders to celebrate the uh, 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. When people ask me what PEPFAR uh, represents for me, I think it represents uh, three things. One is hope, second is impact, and thirdly is partnership, the power of partnership. I, I, I stayed there because uh, PEPFAR has transformed the trajectory of HIV AIDS on the continent of Africa in a dramatic way. For those of us who have been in the field of HIV AIDS for, for many, many years, I personally joined uh, the field of HIV AIDS in 1988. And before PEPFAR was announced on the 29th of January, 2003, there was a total sense of helplessness across the continent. But today, we have seen the power of partnership, hope, and what PEPFAR has transformed, how PEPFAR has transformed that trajectory of HIV AIDS. 25 million lives have been saved. 5.5 million children have been born free of HIV AIDS. Uh, systems, health systems have been strengthened in a remarkable way, remarkable way. Laboratory systems up to 3,000 labs have been strengthened and accredited across Africa. 340,000 healthcare workers have been trained and they are currently being used in the fight against HIV AIDS and other um, uh, disease threats. Uh, over 70,000 facilities have been strengthened. There are other very positive consequences of or impact of, of PEPFAR. Immunization rates have increased by 10% in countries that uh, PEPFAR support, that is general, general immunization in children. Life expectancy has bounced back to about 12 to 15 years in countries that PEPFAR has uh, uh, had investment. Uh, uh, GDPs have increased by uh, up to about 2.9%. So PEPFAR has not only had an impact on uh, saving lives, it also had a developmental uh, impact in the countries that uh, uh, PEPFAR has uh, operated in more than uh, 20 years. So truly a moment to reflect, sit back and reflect what PEPFAR has done and where we go from here. Thank you, Dr. Nkingasong. Uh, we will now begin the question and answer portion of today's briefing. Uh, for those asking questions live, once again, please click the raise hand button or type your question directly into the Q&A tab. And just as a reminder, please do uh, type in your full name, location, and uh, the affiliation, the press outlet that you're with. 
Um, we do ask that you, you limit yourself to just one question and that that question be related to uh, today's topic, which is the 20th anniversary of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, as well as the country operations planning meeting taking place in South Africa. Uh, so for our first question, Dr. Nkengasong, uh, you mentioned uh, the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR, and that's quite a milestone. Uh, so what would you consider the program's biggest contribution in HIV AIDS response? The biggest impact has been shape the trajectory of uh, where a continent like Africa was heading towards uh, a total catastrophe uh, caused by HIV AIDS. Uh, remember before PEPFAR, only 50,000 people, 50,000 people on the continent of Africa who were infected were on treatment, 50,000. Today, over 20 million people are, are, are receiving life-saving uh, antiretroviral therapy. That is remarkable. Uh, PEPFAR has also transformed uh, the way that uh, we perceive transmission of HIV in, uh, or in children where to the extent that in some countries like Botswana, we're actually working with that country to completely eliminate uh, HIV uh, uh, transmission from mothers to, uh, uh, to children. So really, as I said earlier, saving 25 million lives, preventing transmission of HIV AIDS from mother to infant in about, and saving about 5.5 million children is just a matter. Remember five, uh, 10, 20 years ago, it was a death sentence. Thank you very much. That's uh, quite an impressive record. Um, so that goes a little to the question which was submitted by Mr. Onishias Mamba from Kwitu FM of uh, Zambia. Um, and uh, Mr. Mamba asks, uh, how many lives have been preserved in the 20 years of PEPFAR's existence? I think you addressed that. Although if there are any further details you'd like to offer, I'm, I'm sure we'd all be interested uh, to know that. And he further asks, um, how much has been spent on the program? Let me uh, further emphasize the impact that, as I said earlier, and I really want to amplify this, that the, the economies, the economy of countries that prefers invested averagely have increased, uh, the GDP has been increased by up to about 2.4, 2.6%. Uh, That's remarkable. Why is that? Because if you know, remember, PEPFAR, uh, uh, before PEPFAR was launched, HIV AIDS was killing young people. And your, the, your human capital is the greatest asset that you have. And PEPFAR reversed that trajectory. People are living now with HIV AIDS. People are going to school uh, and working and contributing in uh, the, the economy. So that is very powerful. It should never be um, uh, ignored. Uh, PEPFAR has also had a significant impact on what I call the health security or, or national security. Imagine those uh, if the trajectory had continued the way uh, it, it was projected to continue, you have so many orphans on the continent. And those orphans will be without hope, they will be despair, and that could easily lead to a serious security threat, serious security threat all over. Because any human being who is uh, who lives with despair and hopelessness doesn't, uh, 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 it's not difficult to become vulnerable to uh, security issues across uh, the world, uh, like uh, uh, terrorism and, and others. Financially, PEPFAR has invested over 110 billion, 110 billion over the course of uh, the program. That is remarkable. Is it, it is the largest program in the history of infectious diseases devoted by one country to solving one disease. I've never, we've not seen that in 100 years. PEPFAR also represents, in my view, the greatest manifestations of the values of the people of America, because it's truly a gift from the people of America to the people of Africa and the rest of the world in solving a unique problem that reflects the core values of what uh, Americans stand for. Uh, once again, those are some uh, very impressive uh, superlatives. Thank you for sharing those details. Um, just one quick follow-up on that. So uh, the lives that have been preserved uh, by the program and the money that's been spent on the program, um, would you say that most of that has been spent on the continent of Africa? Oh, 95% of that has been spent on the continent of Africa. We have PEPFAR programs in Southeast Asia, like in Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, India, 
uh, Kazakhstan that majority of paper spending uh, intervention has been in Africa, rightfully so, because Africa carries the largest burden of HIV AIDS uh, in the whole world. Just to put that in, in context, last year, uh, there were 1.5 million new cases of HIV AIDS and over 60% of those were in Africa. And last year, of the, about close to 650,000 uh, people who died of HIV AIDS 425,000 were in Africa. So I think that uh, the, the, um, the large amount of uh, attention and the, the devotion of the resources in Africa is very proportionate to the burden of the disease. So that was very clear. Thank you. So uh, I'll move again to uh, another, another question which was submitted um, in our chat. Uh, and we are, of course, uh, joining all these journalists from South Africa. And uh, you are here for a conference which is uh, being hosted in South Africa. Um, so uh, Ms. Uh, Tamar Khan of uh, South Africa's Business Day uh, asks, um, or she, she remarks that the number of people on retroviral, antiretroviral treatment in South Africa uh, has flatlined at just over 5 million people uh, since 2019, 2020. And she goes on to ask, uh, what does South Africa need to do uh, differently if it is to accelerate the number of people on treatment and reach the 95, 95, 95 targets? By the way, perhaps you could also clarify the, the concept of the 95, 95 targets. Yeah, that, that is a very good concept. Let me, uh, before I answer that question, um, clarify what we are collectively, <laughs> what the, the world has agreed to do. The world has agreed that by the year 2030, we should bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat. That's a UN uh, 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 sustainable development goals that we've all agreed on. We've also agreed as the world that a pathway to get into 2030 is to be sure that countries achieve the 95, 95, 95. What does that mean? It means uh, identifying 95% of people who are HIV infected so that they know their status. Once the 95% of those who know their statement uh, are identified, you link them to treatment. And once you, you link them to treatment, make sure 95% of those achieve viral load suppression, which is they have undetectable virus. Because we've seen the power of virus when it's undetectable, when patients who are HIV positive receive treatment and their virus is undetectable, it benefits the individual, it also benefits the community because transmission is, um, is almost zero. You can actually deliver uh, for a pregnant woman a, uh, uh, who is HIV positive, uh, uh, an HIV negative uh, baby. And then of course you lead a normal life with that. We saw during my stay here in uh, South Africa, we went to a clinic just last week with a group of uh, senators and we saw a, a young man who uh, was HIV negative and knew that the spouse was HIV positive, but because they received the treatment, they had two wonderful children that were all HIV negative. That is the power of the treatment program that you can live a normal life with your HIV status. That's what it means by 95, 95, 95. In South Africa, um, uh, they are, they've done a remarkable job in identifying people that are infected, and knowing their status, about 94%. Remember of the 95, they are, they are down 94%. But where the challenge is, is to link those 94% to treatment. There's a, a big gap there. So I think that's where the effort uh, should be. So continue to identify uh, people who are HIV positive so that they know that they are HIV positive, but very importantly, link them up to treatment. And once you link them up to treatment, ensure that they remain on treatment they adhere to treatment and achieve viral load suppression. All right, thank you very much. So um, obviously South Africa is a big player in our program and uh, thank you for addressing that. I'll go to one of the other uh, larger countries perhaps where you operate, uh, Kenya. So for Mr. John Muchangi of the Star newspaper in Kenya asks, um, or rather he observes that in the 2023 guidance letter to PEPFAR beneficiaries, um, PAPFAR emphasizes that it will prioritize its funding on projects that support key populations, such as men who have sex with men and sex workers. Um, how does the program 
navigate legal hurdles um, because as Mr. Bushangi uh, observes, um, uh, homosexuality and sex work are illegal in Kenya uh, and there are legal uh, challenges in other African countries as well. Um, so how does the program navigate that legal landscape? So let me clarify uh, something, first of all, which is extremely important that uh, it is not PEPFAR in Kenya navigating that. It is the people of Kenya, the government of Kenya, uh, leading the response. And PEPFAR is your partner in supporting the, the Kenya's effort to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat by the year 2030. That distinction is very, very important. So that it's not seen like uh, it's an American program coming into Kenya to, to do and address all the structural issues there. So, so that brings me to uh, what I usually uh, uh, characterize as the power of partnership. We must work closely with the government of Kenya, supporting their efforts. They are the, they are the leaders in this effort, so that we all sit down together with the community leaders and find a way to address the inequalities and inequities that exist in those uh, 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 what we call priority populations. And we have said in the same letter that we issued that there are three priority populations that we should focus effort in. One is children, because we see remarkable inequities in children. Second is adolescent girls and young women. And thirdly is key population, men who have sex with men, LGBTQI, female sex workers are all key population. And each category of the priority population requires a, a strategy. And that strategy cannot be uh, uh, dictated for, or conceived in Washington. It has to be conceived locally because who else knows the context, the socioeconomic, cultural context than the country. That's why I emphasize that country leadership is key. We are a partner. So what does that mean in, in uh, men who have sex with men in, in Canada? That we see this truly as a public health issue that we address. We want to address a public health issue. We recognize that if we do not address HIV AIDS in uh, key populations, including men, men who have sex with men, female sex workers, we will never arrive at our target. The target is to eliminate HIV, to bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat by the year 2030. So again, uh, no one has a, a, a silver bullet on this, but I believe that we have to work collectively with the civil society, with community leaders, religious leaders, and political leadership to find uh, uh, ways that we can begin to bring down the structural barriers. We have to build bridges with the community and build bridges that will enable us to solve the problem that is at hand, which is to bring HIV AIDS to an end rather than build walls. Okay, if we build walls uh, 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 between us and different sub subsets of community, we will never be able to successfully bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so um, you touched a little bit on uh, the way you work with the health systems in the various countries where you operate. Uh, so we have one related question to that from uh, one of our um, journalists here in South Africa, Pamela Kumba from South African Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, so Pamela asks, um, how has PEPFAR strengthened the health system in Africa? And are there any examples that you'd like to point out? Pamela, good to hear from you again. Uh, PEPFAR has, in order to achieve that impact that I just described, saving 20, 21, 25 million lives and most of them in Africa and uh, directly impacting uh, uh, and saving 5.5 uh, million children born free of HIV AIDS, PEPFAR has had to invest vast assets in strengthening public health systems, including surveillance system, uh, information systems, laboratory system, human resources across the board, including infrastructure innovation, building hospitals, laboratories across multiple countries that PEPA has operated. And those same infrastructure is being used today in fighting other emerging infections like the current COVID pandemic, uh, PEPA, you know, the, the infrastructure and architecture that PEPA put in place was extremely, extremely valuable and handy in fighting uh, COVID, including a scaling of, of, of vaccination, infection prevention control measures, uh, rolling out testing, 
and conducting contact tracing there. So I think that is really the added benefit of PEP platforms that have been put in place over the last 20 years. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, so I'd like to go to another submitted question, which we uh, have online uh, from BBC and Soy. Um, so Anne asks, uh, the development of pediatric ARVs, antiretroviral um, uh, drugs, um, have been uh, uh, left behind since virtually no child is infected with HIV in the developed world. Okay, so she points to a systemic problem there. Uh, that has meant that often children in Africa or in lower income countries um, who, who get infected are given adult regimens and that those adult regimens are, are split at the discretion of caregivers. Um, she remarks that is never accurate. So is that an area where PEPFAR has been doing any work? And if so, yes, what? Absolutely. PEPFAR and other partners have been doing a lot of work in that area. And PEPFA is part of the, the Global Alliance that was just launched in Tanzania uh, by the First Lady of, of Tanzania um, uh, just uh, in, in, I think, first week of February. Uh, PEPFA is part of the, the Rome consultation, which is all focused on, on pediatrics. I was there in Rome in December with my team uh, uh, to continue to support uh, a collective approach to that. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, that has been, uh, that is drugs, specific drugs, adaptation, formulation for children has been a, a problem. But the good news is that there are now new formulations for children that have uh, been made and we are committed to ex uh, expanding that. I just announced at the uh, country operation plan meeting that there will be a, a fund that will set aside for up to about 40 million that will continue to uh, push countries to uh, scale up uh, uh, and address those inequities that exist in children, that exist in uh, um, key population, that exist in adolescent girls and women. That it doesn't exclude the country's own programming, but it's an additional funding that will enable countries to compete for if they have bold ideas to reach out children more using uh, innovative uh, ways. There, so we are looking at the, taking the problem very seriously. When we say in a five-year strategy that children adolescent girls and young women and key population are a priority, we mean it. It is really a priority because that is where the burden of the disease is. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very clear. So um, we have uh, another question that's sort of related to that um, in the sense of the um, science and the pharmacology of the treatments. So Mr. Baldin Waliula from uh, Standard Media Group in Kenya, asks, what are the scientific developments in the HIV and AIDS sector and what does the future look like? I'm very positive of the future of uh, the tools that are uh, uh, developing uh, in the pipeline in the fight against HIV AIDS. And, and positive for several reasons. One is that we, uh, we have a pipeline of, of uh, molecules or interventions that are coming on that uh, we call in a PrEP, which is a pre-exposure prophylaxis that actually will help us in the prevention. Okay, where uh, injectables that uh, adolescent girls and young women and key pops can inject and only come and you see them only after three months. Okay, and that as PrEP, this is, this is for HIV negative people that are at risk. That is remarkable because in as much as we want to get to the 95, 95, 95, uh, which is mainly treatment driven, we want to turn off the tap. I always use the kitchen sink analogy and say, well, if your, your kitchen sink is leaking and water is on the floor, you're wiping it up, consider that to be people we are treating. But unless you turn off the tap, okay, and which is new infections, you continue to clean for, for so long. So we are trying to have new tools like the long-acting uh, 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 injectable uh, pre-exposure uh, uh, prophylaxis that will help us turn up the tap. That is reduce the rate of new infection, especially among a key population, adolescent girls and, and young women. I think that is very, very promising. We also know that over the years, because of science, uh, we've moved from a patient receiving a cocktail of drugs as a handful of pills a day to one tablet a day. That is remarkable. And who knows, going forward, we may actually have uh, in the pipeline 
uh, development of uh, uh, drugs that you may just take one every month or, or so. I think the pipeline is looking very good. Is the pipeline looking very uh, promising for vaccine? Not so much for vaccine. Just want to be clear that a vaccine will be very important if we ever have the hope of completely eliminating and eradicating HIV AIDS. This is the first time I'm using the word eliminating and eradicating HIV AIDS, just like we did for um, the, uh, 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 chicken pox. It will, be, it, it will require a vaccine, right? Um, so, but we, we are not yet there, but we have these other molecules that I just described that are, are, are in the pipeline. You have the ring vaginal uh, 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 products that women can use uh, uh, at their will. So the pipeline is looking very, very promising thanks to, um, uh, um, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, the science. I mean, I mean smallpox, not, not chickenpox. Thank you. Uh... So if I could continue with uh, one more question, there's a couple of questions actually, which are related, um, which also go to the pharmacology, some of the science. Uh, so uh, Mr. Yusuf Bah from uh, Al Jazeera in Guinea and uh, Ms. Uh, Patricia Bonsu from Lab FM in Ghana um, asked similar questions. Uh, so obviously uh, coronavirus has had a big impact on the continent um, and uh, how would you say that uh, the, um, the impact of the coronavirus epidemic and also other uh, viral infections like Marburg, for example, um, how have those impacted the work of PEPFAR in addressing the HIV AIDS? Very good question. I have always said that uh, in my public speaking on, uh, uh, on Global Health, uh, for the last 25 years, HIV AIDS have defined Global Health by strengthening the system that I just outlined. Uh, but we are beginning to see how emerging infections like Ebola, Marburg, monkeypox, or Mpox as it's now called, and, and COVID are threatening the, the HIV program because they are disrupted. Each time you have emergence of such infection, what happens? We store the HIV program because we turn attention fully into uh, those, um, uh, to eliminate those programs. I mean, we know what happened with uh, COVID. When COVID was, was at the height of COVID, it disrupted TB program, malaria program, and HIV program. And we started seeing excess mortality among patients that were receiving ARV or HIV infected patients who subsequently died because of these other infections rather than because of, of, of HIV. So we continue to see that. We also have to admit that we are seeing an increasing rate of emergence of, 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 of diseases. Uh, just in 2002, it was a remarkable, 20, 2022 rather, was a remarkable year because WHO declared public health emergency of international uh, concern in, uh, uh, with, with three diseases, Ebola, uh, COVID, and Mpox. Has never been seen in the history of the, the, the last 75 years in the history of WHO. It just tells us that we are now in a world that these diseases are emerging more frequently. Uh, just to put that in context, the first case of uh, Ebola uh, was identified in DRC in 1976. It took 20 years later before uh, the, the second outbreak occurred in DRC. But nowadays, you see more frequent occurrence of, 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 of Ebola almost yearly. And because of that, uh, resources are always channeled to our attention. It, it's move away from HIV and focus on, on these other infections there. So that's what we continue to see. That's why in our new strategy, we have elevated a pillar called public health system and security, which means how can we position assets that are used for HIV AIDS in such a way that when you have a new out, uh, outbreak, you can quickly, quickly and intentionally mobilize those assets, take care of that in emerging infection so that you can get back to HIV AIDS. Just remember COVID killed about uh, 260,000 people in Africa in three years. HIV alone killed 400, 425,000 people in one year. So that's how serious and how uh, 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 the threat that we still have in front of us with respect to HIV. The, the tricky thing is that 
the young people don't see HIV AIDS the way we saw HIV AIDS because we've done a very good job with PEPFAR, Global Phone, at cleaning the nasty face, face of HIV AIDS. So people don't see that threat. It's not as evident as a COVID where you get a fever and you stay home, you sick and, and you cough and then perhaps uh, you get treated or you, you die from it. So that is the threat we are seeing where emerging infections are becoming a serious threat to HIV AIDS, disrupting service delivery, affecting people that are HIV infected in a way that they cannot well, uh, fight up this new infection. We've seen that in during the COVID-19 pandemic at the height of it, people that were HIV positive were not able to clean up the virus quickly. And that became a very serious threat for them. So um, Ambassador King Song, we've had a, a few questions on one topic, which uh, obviously a, a major concern or interest here uh, from uh, John Machangi of Star Newspaper in Kenya, from uh, Ann Soy of, um, uh, of BBC and also from Kara Anna of, of AP. So they're all interested to know, um, how do you see the budget and resources trend line for the program? And uh, if they're, well, regardless of what the budget and resources trend line might look like, um, is there any work on uh, assisting the, um, the beneficiary governments in particular the African governments uh, to begin to contribute more to their effort or to the PEPFAR effort, whichever one it might be. Let, let me just say that um, two weeks ago, I was in uh, Addis Ababa to attend the, uh, the African Union uh, Head of State Summit. And I did present to the head of states, about 33 of them, who are the, 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 the head of states that are in the orientation committee of the AU NEPAD, which is the developmental uh, organ of, of, of the AU. Uh, the 20 years impact of PEPFAR. And it was very well received. It was the first time that PEPFAR was presented among such a large number of, of head of states. Uh, then we had another consultation with uh, uh, partners and uh, government uh, two days later, and they issued a declaration. And if you look at a series of declarations on the AU website on page 66 of that, you see a declaration that the head of states have issued a statement or declaration rather saying that uh, they are committed to the Abuja declaration of the, or recommitting to that, which is the 15% threshold for, for financing, domestic financing. They are recommitting to the fight against HIV AIDS. They've asked actually AU NEPAD and Africa CDC to develop a sustainability roadmap costed from now to 2030. And they have agreed that a special summit will be hosted, uh, uh, that they will organize a special summit by head of state and focus on HIV AIDS and, and other pandemics. I thought it was a remarkable political commitment, a remarkable achievement that uh, I had uh, in my, uh, during my stay in Addis Ababa. So I think everybody is aware and acknowledges that we need to sustain the response. We still have a lot of work to do to get to 2030. Uh, donor funding is just one pocket of the funding, uh, including bilateral like PEPFAR, we need a global fund, but you need to sustain this response. You need increased domestic financing. And it's not a new conversation. South Africa contributes in excess of 80% of its own resources in the fight against HIV AIDS. Never in Namibia contributes more than 70% in the fight and Botswana. So we, we know country that is everybody doing the same thing? No, other countries are, are stretched financially and we will be developing, sitting down with the countries to developing a, a sustainability framework. So that, I mean, your companies, whatever the AU will develop in terms of a roadmap to get into 2030. So I think um, the, 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 the goodwill is there, uh, the commitment is now to follow so that we all are, are seen looking in the same direction and heading in the same direction. Just to say that this is a, a very important year for PEPFAR. PEPFAR needs to be reauthorized this year. And I'm very encouraged that uh, a series of senators, our five or so were here in South Africa, reviewed the program and they left with a very positive impression of the impact that PEPFAR has uh, had in saving lives on the continent. And I'm hoping that that positive energy will translate to uh, a PEPFAR reauthorization, which uh, will happen this year, which will be, means that we continue to have additional resources to support in the fight against HIV AIDS on the continent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nkinga Song, you've been very generous with your time. I think we probably better 
I'll try to bring it home with maybe just one or two more questions, if that's all right with you. Um, so um, uh, Sarah Jerving from DevEx um, is uh, asking about the ongoing um, uh, conference that you're a part of, uh, the country operational plan process. And uh, I think, um, you know, given that you're in the midst of that um, process and those meetings right now, it would be interesting uh, to hear if you have any preliminary insights or any takeaways you can share. And uh, Sarah's specific question relates to the, uh, the planning process. Um, and she notes that it's shifting from one to two years. Um, so uh, how do you see that as affecting the, um, the, the process? No, Sarah, thank you. And good to, uh, to um, connect with you again. Uh, Sarah was one of, um, I mean, I'll call it a team. As, as the whole team that I work with during my time at the Africa CDC. And I must say, uh, together with Anne and a whole host of other journalists on this call, uh, they did a remarkable job in, in COVID um, uh, and in fighting the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So the reason I'm here in South Africa this week and next week is that we have made very intentionally shifted the way pepper planning occurs. First is we are really emphasizing country leadership where we're saying, look, if we agree on the two things that I mentioned earlier, i.e. that we get bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030 and achieve 95, 95, 95 goals by the year 2025, we need to shift from one year planning to two years planning so that we give time for implementation. So we all come here plan and with ministers, civil society has had a very big voice. Yesterday was the opening, civil society uh, uh, or discuss the the the, the, uh, the the people's cup, which will be factored into it. So we started up early. In previous uh, uh, country operational planning, we used to meet countries at the tail end. Now we are meeting the countries early, so that three things happen: the countries tell us where their epidemic is. As I've seen, the team is know your know your epidemic. Who else knows the epidemic, and who else can lead the epidemic, the fight against the epidemic, other than the country? So the countries are doing that. Then we as a partner, PEPFAR as a partner will come in and say, look, we see where you want to go with this. And this is uh, our five-year strategic plan. And let's see how we can align. Civil society comes in and say, these are things that we see in, this, in the community that we must address. So we have a kind of a triangular conversation. At the end of the stay here, we hope that there will be a common framework emerging so that when they get back home, they can very quickly sit down around the table in the next uh, eight weeks to 10 weeks, complete the whole planning. Okay, that way we are co-planning it, we are co-creating it, and it's not the, the PEPA leading the response, it's the country leading the response. PEPA is a partner as any other partner, so that is new. I've also made sure that I took money off the table. We've sent in allocation letters to say, look, South Africa, you get X million, you get, uh, Kenya, you get X, and well, that way we don't come in here to uh, 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 speculate whether the programs will fund it. So money is off the table. What I wanted people to do for the next one week here, this week and next week, is to focus on the issues. The issue is where is your ep epidemic? Where can what can we do together to get to 95, 95, 95, and subsequently to uh, 2030? So it sounds to me that this shift in the planning process from one to two years is a method of both putting in place some long-term planning and also um, uh, perhaps um, facilitating uh, the beneficiary countries' ownership and their own um, involvement Absolutely. in the processes. Yes, and stability has been a key thing here and how do we sustain this? One thing I should also add is that we are bringing in new partners what I call transformative partnerships. Uh, the African Development Bank is here with us for the first time. Their, their vice president is, is here. Uh, senior leadership at the MasterCard Foundation is here. Uh, the World Bank uh, 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 was not able to be here. But they, they Zoom in live yesterday. So I'm bringing all these partners to say, look, we have to look at resources from all angles. Domestic resources, donors, bilateral resources like that, like those from PEPFAR, but also development banks on the continent and foundations that are operating on the continent. Because uh, in my previous job as uh, the director of Africa CDC, 
I saw that uh, if you engage people and articulate the issue well, there is always funding around. The Afri Exim Bank, uh, who was invited, was the, the, a, a bank that was able to leverage about $2 billion to enable the AU procure vaccine at the height of the COVID um, pandemic. So if you bring people around the table, there's power in, in, in collectivity, there's power in unity to, in solving a, a problem at like HIV AIDS. So we should bring those banks together, foundations together, so that we synergize our, 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 the, the common port of resources to bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, and once again, thank you for being so generous with your time with us today. Uh, I think we got to an awful lot of questions on, on, on a lot of very different and diverse topics. And I know that uh, I personally feel that I'm a lot better educated about this topic now than I ever have been. So uh, it's been a really valuable experience. So um, uh, before we bring it to a complete close, I wanted to find out if you have any final thoughts that you didn't get to, if any, you have any final thoughts for our no, listeners. My, my final thought is always to the media, that uh, I, I work with the media very closely. I mean, I, I, believe, I believe strongly so, and those who have worked with me and Sarah and others uh, and will know that um, uh, it's always a partnership. When I started off this conversation, I said PEPFAR represented hope, it represented impact and partnership. And partnership with the media is always uh, one of my uh, priorities because that is the uh, segue to uh, I mean the, the population, reaching the population that uh, transparently with, uh, the, uh, with, with the key messages and with the actions that we are, we are taking. I'll just end by saying that just today I read um, the, uh, there's a CNN article that says the United States has saved 25 million lives, but nobody knows about it. You can Google and see that article. That is really uh, an example of what, why working closely with the media is so important. Okay, so that that story is, is told not in terms of publicity, but in terms of impact, in terms of reality. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, gains in, in, in positivity, in ten, sharing positive stories, remarkable stories as, such as the ones that Pepper has created. So that's a very good article that speaks to why working with media is so important for me. Well, thank you very much. And working with the media is important to us as well. So um, it has been a really, really valuable experience for us to have you here with us today. And uh, I hope it's been valuable for the journalists who have joined us today as well. Um, and I hope that they will uh, remain in touch with us closely. Uh, so let me uh, thank uh, Dr. John and King Song, uh, U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy at the U.S. State Department, uh, which is our parent agency here at the uh, Africa Regional Media Hub. Uh, for joining us today, and thanks to all the journalists for participating. Um, if you have any questions about today's briefing, uh, please contact us, um, the uh, Africa Regional Media Hub at afmediahub at state.gov. Uh, and please note that a, a recording and a transcript of today's hub call will be available uh, to you as soon as we can produce it. So once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Nkinga Song, and thank you to our journalists.